so last lecture, we we're looking at some examples of data races towards the end of the lecture. And what I want to do today is start looking at how we can try to avoid some of these sorts of problems of data races, race conditions, and so on. Uh, in particular, by introducing uh, mutual exclusion mechanisms so we can have ways to guarantee that we don't have multiple threads enter into a critical section of the code at the same time. And in particular, what I want to look at uh, is uh, what's called a mutex. So again, a mutex is a basically a locking uh, mechanism that's used for synchronization and is essentially used to guarantee that two threads don't enter into a critical section at the same time. So this can uh, help to avoid some of the problems that we've been seeing in some of the earlier code examples. Uh, mutexes have two basic operations, what's called acquire. You can acquire a mutex or hold the mutex or lock the mutex. They essentially all mean the same thing. Or we can release a mutex or unlock the mutex or relinquish the mutex. They all essentially mean the same thing. And you can think of a token, uh, a mutex as sort of being like a unique token that you can hold or not hold. It can't be duplicated, cloned or whatever. There's only one of them in existence. And essentially when you acquire the mutex here as a thread, you're saying like, please give me this token. Um, and when you release it, you're presumably already holding it and you're saying I'm done with it and you're giving it back so other people can pick it up and take it. And the basic idea is that the mutex, in other words, in the analogy, you can think of it like a token. It can only be held by one thread at a time. And this is what allows you to achieve mutual exclu exclusion with it. So if, if I'm a thread and I, I take this token, I acquire the mutex, if anyone else tries to acquire it, what will happen is your, pro your thread will be blocked and it will wait until you can acquire the mutex, but you can't get it until I'm done with it, until I release it. So this is what allows us to achieve a mutual exclusion. A little bit more about mutex is it's, it's considered to be an error if you try to relock a mutex you already hold. And I'll comment on this a little bit uh, later, I think on the next slide, in a bit more detail. And I guess the basic idea behind a mutex is if, if there's some kind of shared resource, like multiple threads are sharing some resource, the most common case is you're sharing some kind of state, some kind of data, um, in other words, variables. Um, but there could be other resources that you're sharing. The basic idea is if you have a resource that's shared that you want to access and having more than one thread access it at the same time would be a problem. And in a lot of cases, it will be. Uh, what you do is you can wrap the access to the shared resource in a, in a in an acquiring of a mutex and release of a mutex. So the basic idea is before you access the shared resource, you acquire the mutex. And then when you're done with the resource, you release the mutex. And the basic idea is all the threads follow the convention that unless they're holding the mutex, they're forbidden from accessing the shared resource, for example, some shared variables. And by doing this, we can achieve mutual exclusion. So only one thread at any given time can be accessing that shared resource. And then we can avoid a lot of the problems that would come from two threads or multiple threads accessing the same sh shared resource at the same time, where most typically this might be a shared variable that's shared between them. Any questions? Again, for those of you who come from a computer science background, I'm sure that this is, is a review for you. But again, I want to bring everyone to sort of the same level. So in terms of C++ in the standard library, there's a class called std mutex, which essentially provides mutex functionality. Uh, the class is not movable and not copyable. So you know, in particular, it's not movable. Like you, you can't propagate the value of mutexes around. Um, it provides a lock member function which acquires the mutex and it blocks as necessary. So if you try to acquire the mutex and some other thread is already holding it, you get put to sleep until you can actually successfully acquire the mutex. And then there's a member function called unlock which releases the mutex. A thread that owns the mutex should not attempt to lock the mutex again. The reason why is to allow some flexibility in terms of how mutexes are implemented. If you imagine that the, the algorithm was implemented in the following way, uh, step one um, is the mutex being held by, some, by some, anyone. Step two, if it is, I go to sleep waiting for it to become available. Um, if you imagine that the algorithm was like that and you, you try to acquire a mutex that you're already holding, so the algorithm goes as follows, go to sleep until you know, the mutex becomes available. Okay, I go to sleep. But now I've just deadlocked because it can never become available because I was the one that was holding it in the first place. Um, so this is the one of the reasons why you, you know, you're not allowed to lock a mutex you already hold. Uh, this is why the, the language standard uh, forbids this, is it gives more flexibility in terms of how you might implement things. Some operating systems might be smart enough to say, hey, wait a minute, you already hold this mutex error. But the thing is, they want to allow for more flexibility in implementation. So someone could literally just implement it by not looking who's holding the mutex and they just say, is anyone holding it? If so, I'm putting you to sleep. And it doesn't matter if you're the one that's holding the mutex or not. 
And then the last thing I want to comment on with respect to the Mutex class is that it's another uh, thing in the library, standard library, that can introduce, uh, synchronizes with relationships. We saw before that thread creation and thread joining can introduce synchronization with relationships. This is another really important operation that can uh, introduce, uh, synchronizes with relationships. And in particular, any unlock operations for a mutex that happen earlier in time than the time where you do a lock operation, the earlier unlock operations synchronize with the lock operation. So this is really important because it, it can allow us to establish happens before relationships between two, di two different threads. And this is like one big reason for wanting to use mutexes. So a little bit more detail about uh, the members that are provided by the mutex class. Uh, the first thing we have is some member types. There's something called native handle type, which are provided by a number of different concurrency classes in the standard library. They basically give you hooks into the underlying implementation because every operating system will have its own way of implementing, for example, something like a mutex. And maybe you want to get access to that underlying thing that's being used by the operating system, maybe to get some additional functionality that you can't access directly by the the interface that's provided directly by the std mutex type, um, then you can use this. Um, in this course, we're never going to need to use this uh, type. This is kind of for much more advanced and kind of platform specific code that you might be writing. Uh, then we have the number of different member functions. We have uh, constructors and a destructor. Um, the notable thing here, notice there's no assignment operators because you can't move or copy these things. There's also no, no move constructor, no copy constructor. In terms of other member functions, we have like a member function called lock, which basically allows us to acquire the mutex. It will block if the mutex is not available until we can actually successfully acquire it. Uh, then we have what's called try lock. And what this does is it provides a non-blocking kind of way to attempt to acquire the mutex. What will happen is you, you literally try to acquire the mutex, but if someone else holds it, rather than blocking, you just return saying you're, you know, it was unable to acquire the mutex for you. Uh, but typically of these two functions, the one typically that you'll use is the one that blocks because you, one of the things you want to avoid in concurrent programming is you spit, spin in a loop in your code saying like, is, is something ready, is something ready? Like you don't want to spin in a loop saying, can I acquire the mutex? Can I acquire the mutex? Can I acquire the mutex? And loop there, you know, 100 billion times, you know, burning up this one of the CPU cores doing no useful work. Um, so most typically, at least in this course, we're, we're not going to have any need for the non-blocking version, but there are some special cases where you might want to do this. Uh, but more typically, we tend to want to block and, and avoid kind of having a CPU spin in a busy loop doing not really much of anything. Uh, then we have an, a member function called unlock, which releases the mutex, and then a function called native handle, which allows us to get access to one of these things, which we can then get maybe some other additional features uh, access to that are very operating specific. But again, we're not going to be using the native handles for any of the types that we're talking about in this course. Uh, so let's look at an example of how we can use mutexes. So this is basically building on an earlier example. We had an earlier example, which was almost identical code to this. This is where we had two threads, uh, T1 and T2, which are executing the same function, which is just looping, uh, incrementing some counter where this counter is shared between the two uh, threads. So essentially what we had was exactly this code before, except we were missing line 10 and we were missing line 12. And because of this, we were having a potential of data races because both threads could basically be accessed and counter at the same time with at least one of them writing. Uh, so this was problematic. Uh, the way that we can solve this here is we can use mutexes. So what I can do is I can introduce, or sorry, there's one other difference in the code. We didn't have this line number five in the previous example either. So we introduce this mutex, which is called M, and this is what we're going to use to uh, protect the critical section in our code. Essentially, the increment of counter is a critical section. Like we do not want multiple threads executing that line at the same time, because if we do, we open up the possibility that there can be data races and all of the bad things that can come from that, which is essentially undefined behavior. So what we do is we, you know, sort of the pattern that we use is we wrap the critical section in a lock unlock pair. So at the be before we enter into the critical section, we do a lock of the mutex. And this ensures that once you get past this lock, like once the lock returns, you know that you're the only thread that's executing in the critical section because any other thread, like as soon as you get past the lock, that means you've acquired the mutex. And because only one thread can hold the mutex at any given time, you must be the one unique one that holds it. And then at the end, after we've executed the critical section, then we are very careful to do an unlock. If we forgot to leave this or put this uh, unlock in, then what would happen is the next time someone goes to lock the mutex, they're just going to deadlock because no one's ever going to release it. Therefore, they're never going to come out of the lock function and they just sit there. And eventually all the threads of the system will just deadlock and, and that won't be good. 
Uh, so you have to be very careful to make sure that you in include the call to unlock. And maybe one other comment I can make with respect to this example. I mean, the way that the code is written here is not the way that would be advisable to write the code. There's actually a potential problem that can kind of arise in practice, which is that um, the common mistake when you're writing code with mutex is you forget to release the mutex when you're done with it. And the particular style in which this code is written here, it's, it's very easy to forget to do the unlock. I mean, maybe we be very, be very careful to remember to put the lock in because we're thinking critical section, we put this in, but then we forget the unlock. Um, so this is kind of brittle the way that we're coding things here with respect to it's easy to forget the unlock. Uh, so I'm going to come back in a, a few slides later and revisit this issue. There's a much better way to write the code that we can kind of eliminate the possibility that we forget to unlock the mutex later, essentially by using an RAI class. Anyway, but with that said, I want to kind of take a slight detour into talking about synchronizes with relationships again, now that we've at least seen one example that's using mutexes. Uh, so in this particular code example, what I have is something I just want to use to illustrate like what synchronizes with means sort of in the context of mutexes, like how it manifests itself and how it might potentially be helpful. Uh, so what we have here is a, a multi-threaded program consisting of two threads and they're sharing this data. They have a mutex that they're sharing along with more importantly this, these integer variables x and y which are initialized to zero. And then we have some code um, in thread one which is trying to write the value of the shared variable x and then we have thread two trying to read the value of the shared variable x. And if we didn't do anything with mutexes, so if we took out the lock unlock lock, uh, calls from both of these uh, pieces of code, then we would have data potential for data races and so on, like lots of bad things can happen. Uh, by adding in these lock and unlocks, we, we protect against the fact that, that you know, this line of code here cannot possibly execute at the same time as this line of code here, because this is essentially uh, what we're achieving with the, the use of the mutex, is we're essentially labeling these as critical sections. This, this line here is a critical section, uh, and this line here is effectively a critical section. We make sure that these critical sections never execute at the same time. Um, what I want to do is I want to illustrate in this example the synchronizes with relationships. So suppose that the particular code here runs with the timing that's shown below. So there's obviously many different timings that this program, or at least a few timings that this program could exhibit. But suppose it exhibit, exhibits the precise timing that's shown here. So time is sort of going in the downward direction in this diagram. And what we have first is that thread one is executing first. So it calls the lock uh, function on the mutex. And then it proceeds on to start to maybe do the assignment. And at the same time, this is happening. Thread two comes along and it tries to lock the mutex M. Uh, so what's going to happen is this, this lock operation is going to block because the other thread currently holds it. So only one thread can hold a mutex at a time. So it's going to sit there and just basically be put to sleep. And time's kind of going on. It's still sitting inside the lock function, sitting inside the lock function, and so on. And then in parallel with that, you have thread one continuing to execute. So it sets x equal to one. Then it calls unlock. And what's special about unlock and lock is that any earlier calls to unlock will synchronize with the lock, the return from the lock function. So we're returning from the lock function here. So this is happening like later in time than this unlock call here. So unlock is being called earlier in time. So it's a prior call to unlock. So this will synchronize with the return from the lock call. So what this means is that, you know, this point in the code here, which I've labeled as A, this point in the code here must happen before this point that I've labeled B in the code. Effectively, the point at which you call this function happens before the point that you return from the function uh, lock here. And if you remember, syn synchronizes with relationships uh, establish a happens before relationship. So in, in particular, we can say that, you know, the call, the call to unlock here is happening before the return from this lock function. But the next thing that happens after this is operation B, and the thing that happens just before this is the operation A. So because of this happens before relationship, we're guaranteed that at least if the program runs with the particular timing that's shown here, and again, there could be other timings that it could run with. So we're saying, suppose that it runs with this timing, just as an example. Um, in this particular case, we'd be guaranteed that the value that's re uh, read for x on this line here is going to be x equal to one. And the reason why is because with this particular timing, we're guaranteed that A is happening before B. And the important thing, again, about happens before is not the earlier in time part. I mean, obviously, this is happening earlier in time than this, because like literally one is coming earlier in time in the, in the flow of the, the timeline in this diagram. But the important thing is the result is visible. The result that was computed here, the storing of one into X, is visible at this point. This is what the happens before is telling you that's really important. The result is visible 
So because the result that was written uh, here is visible at the point B, we have to read one for X. Therefore, at least if things execute with this timing, when all is said and done, Y is, y is going to have the value of one assigned to it. And of course, this thread has to also unlock the mutex as well, because if the code continued on and did other stuff, you'd want to make sure that the mutex was released when you were done with it. Any questions? Uh, yeah. Um, is there any, it's like, say thread one code and thread two code was like in a loop. Is there any priority given on, like in this case, thread two, that uh, it was locked waiting for thread one to unlock? But if they were in a loop, like, could technically thread one release the lock and then lock it again? Or is there a priority given to thread two who is locked while the mutex is, or like that thread two requests a lock while it was already locked? Or can I, it just like be faster and require the lock as soon as it gets unlocked? I think what you might be referring to is kind of the issue of fairness. When you have mutexes, you can talk about whether they're fair or not in the sense that, is it possible that one thread can get starved out and never actually be able to lock the mutex because someone else comes along, locks it before they can. Um, there's not any requirement with the mutex types in the standard library, as far as I'm aware, of fairness. So you can possibly get starved out forever. The problem maybe gets worse if you maybe have even more threads, possibly. If you imagine like lots of threads are competing to acquire a mutex, it's possible that there's one poor old thread that just never gets lucky enough to acquire the mutex and it can effectively get starved out. Um, if this was a problem for the particular application you're developing, then you would probably have to do some additional work to try to make sure that that possibility couldn't arise. For some types of code, it's not a big problem because it's unlikely to happen, but in some situations it could be likely to happen and then you would have to take into consideration that, that you'd have to do something special to deal with it. Yeah. This was that way, I think that was the issue that you're getting at. Is that the same question or a different one? Okay. No, I have different. A one. Uh, if thread one and thread two both call m.log at the exact same time, like concurrently at the same time, how does it pick which one to log? Like not fairness, but is there a possibility that they both log the mutex at the exact same time? Well, well they can't, like is essentially the way this would typically be implemented is you're going to be calling out to the operating system to, to, to access some kind of mutex primitive. Um, this is essentially what that, that mutex handle type, the native, whatever it's called, native uh, handle type or gives you uh, access to, like in stored inside this mutex object is the real mutex object, the thing that's doing the real work, which is probably some operating system primitive. Um, so the operating system will make sure, like it will, essentially the way it would typically work is you'll use special CPU instructions that, that, have, that are atomic in nature so that when you're doing the, the locking operation, it's such that it's actually impossible for simultaneity to happen because you'll use some kind of atomic memory access to update the state that's implementing the mutex. Because it's atomic, by definition, they can't overlap. So you can't have the situation arise. But if you didn't implement it that way, then, then you could always have this sort of situation where two threads actually could try to lock at exactly the same time. Uh, but all architectures these days, and probably for a long time, they've always provided some kind of atomic there's various different types of operations that might be used. Sometimes it's called a compare and swap. It's an atomic operation where you test for a, 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 val a memory location of a particular value. And then based on whether it has that value or not, you swap it with another value. And, and there's other types of operations. There's like a number of different types of operations that you could use. But the key thing is they're atomic, which would allow you to achieve this sort of goal. Yeah. So you don't have to worry. Like when, when we say that you know, that only one thread can lock the mutex at once. It really is true. There's not any possibility in, in some kind of very precise timing that you could have bad luck and it doesn't work. It will work. If it doesn't, then the operating system has a bug, essentially. Any other questions? Okay, so um, before I was talking about uh, the way that we had in our code example, we were using the uh, what was it? We were using mutex to try to uh, provide mutual exclusion. And I made the comment that the particular way the code was written is maybe the, not the best way to do things. And, and basically, the, there's a better mechanism for handling locking of mutexes, which is basically this type that I'm about to introduce here, which is called scope lock. So what scope lock is, it's a template class. And it can, it's a variadic template class, so it can take a variable number of template parameters. But all of these template parameters, they're the type, a mutex type. So it can take one or more mutex types. And basically what it allows you to do is it, it, it's a very simple inter interface that's provided. You can create one of these objects and it will lock all the mutexes that you specify as it basically as constructor parameters. You can give it just one, but you can give it as many as you want. It's essentially a variadic type of interface. And um, then when the destructor gets invoked, it will then 
release all of the mutexes that it acquired. And the benefit of using something like scope lock is it becomes impossible to forget to release the mutex because the thing that typically will be invoking the destructor is the language doing it automatically for you. Uh, like assuming it's like a local variable or something like that as automatic storage and the compiler is the thing that invokes the destructors. So therefore you can't forget. So as long as your compiler is not buggy, you're guaranteed that it's impossible to forget to release the mutex. So this is really one of the main uh, benefits of using this scope lock type. Um, the other thing is also because it allows for multiple mutexes and for reasons I'll talk about a little bit later, um, you can run into problems if you try to lock multiple mutexes sort of at the same time um, because I mean, you never really lock them all at the same time. You're, there's some kind of time difference between them and because in terms of how things are locked and so on, you could end up with a deadlock arising and I'll go through an example a little bit later to explain sort of what I mean in more detail. Um, but one of the functionalities that provided by the scope lock is if you try to lock multiple mutexes, it will guarantee that there won't be any deadlock that arises by the way in which they're locked. And again, I'll, I'll give an example a little bit later to illustrate how things can kind of go wrong in this regard. And there's also a kind of a legacy functionality in the standard library, a legacy class called LockGuard, but scope lock effectively replaces it. So I'm not going to talk about LockGuard, but if you're looking at some other examples of code, that maybe a little bit older, you might see them using LockGuard. So in terms of the interfaces provided by this uh, scope lock class, there's a member type, which is just the type of the mutex that's associated with this particular um, type, because again, it's templated on a mutex type, so you can plug different mutex, mutex types into it. So maybe you want to know what the particular type was that the template was instantiated with. This gives you access to that. Uh, we have a constructor and a destructor, and that's pretty much it. Um, the constructor, what it does is it, it any of the, the, basically the constructor parameters are just mutexes to lock, and when the object gets created, it locks them all, uh, using some kind of deadlock avoidance algorithm if you're locking multiple mutexes to try to avoid deadlock that can arise by doing things in a kind of silly way. And then the destructor, essentially what it does is it destroys all the mutex, or it releases all the mutexes before the object goes away and is destroyed. And that's essentially it. Uh, so to give an example of how you might use the scope lock um, class, this is essentially the same code that we were just looking at a little bit earlier. Um, I go back here. So here we were just doing like lock and then increment or counter and then unlock. But this is not a good way to write things because it's easy to forget the unlock. You might say, oh no, I wouldn't do that. But it happens, it happens very frequently. So if you go back here, all we've changed here is rather than using directly using the mutex type, what we're using is scope lock. So to protect against this kind of critical section here or incrementing the counter, what we do is we acquire the mutex M, but we do this not directly. Instead, what we do is we create a scope lock object called lock, and we pass as a constructor parameter M, which is a mutex. And basically what will happen is the constructor will lock this mutex and it won't return until the mutex has been locked. So once we get past this line, the mutex is locked and we can do whatever we want in terms of uh, the counter variable. So we can increment it. And then the nice thing here is we don't have to remember to unlock it because when that lock object goes out of scope, it will automatically be unlocked. The destructor will take care of the unlocking for us. And in this particular case, what's going to happen is at the bottom of the loop, we're going to hit the destructor. Uh, so effectively, when we get to here, it's going to destroy the, or the scope lock object gets destroyed. And before it's destroyed, part of what the destructor will do is release the lock. And then we come up to the top again, we lock it, increment counter, and then we hit to the bottom of the loop, the destructor gets called, it unlocks. So we have the sort of the same functionality as before, but if you write things this way, you, you cannot forget to, to release the mutex because it's, it's basically baked into the, the destructor that's being invoked. Uh, so this is the sense in which I refer to scope lock as an RAII class. I mean, basically it's a class that really its purpose to exist mainly is for doing cleanup in the destructor. Primarily it's releasing any uh, mutexes that you currently hold. Any questions? So this is the recommended way you do things. Like typically you don't do direct like lock unlock operations on mutexes. More typically what you do is do something like this. And this way you can't accidentally forget to unlock the mutex. Uh, and then I have another code example here. This is another uh, code that we looked at earlier, which was this integer set. It provided a very basic kind of interface where we basically have a set of integers and we can query whether a particular integer value is in the set and we can also add an element to the set and that's pretty much it. It's a fairly limited interface. And then we had the same, exactly the same code earlier where we have two threads which are uh, 
in loops, adding a bunch of elements into the, the same container, which is S. In other words, the same integer set. And we observed in this earlier code, I think this was in the last lecture, that this is going to cause all kinds of bad things to happen because the, the data structure associated with S is going to be accessed by um, two threads at the same time. And in, in the best case, they, they maybe don't have a data race, not accessing the same data members at the same time, but they're probably going to corrupt the overall data structure. In some cases, they might touch the same uh, data member at the same time and then possibly have a data race. Anyway, but what we can do here is we can introduce uh, mutexes to try to prevent this code from doing really strange stuff. In other words, invoking undefined behavior due to data races and so on. So what we've done here is we've just, in each one of these functions, we've just introduced scope. We've, well, we've introduced a mutex, first of all. So we have a mutex m underscore, which belongs to this class. And then in each of the member functions here, what we're doing is we're creating a, a lock, a scope lock object, which is then going to lock this mutex m, m underscore. So before we do this find operation where we're actually, you know, doing stuff that requires us to look at this, this underlying data structure, the unordered set that's used to represent this set, we're careful to make sure that no other threads can be accessing things. Essentially, each one of these member functions is wrapped by, protected by a mutex. And when we hit the return statement here, the mutex will be released because eventually when we hit the return statement, this lock, lock object is going to go out of scope when we return, it's a local variable. So this is gonna invoke the destructor, destructor which releases the mutex. And similarly in this function here, we get the same sort of behavior. Uh, when we reach the end of the function, the destructor gets invoked for lock, the lock object, which is going to release the mutex. So this is really nice because we don't have to worry about remembering to unlock the mutex, it will just happen. The only thing we have to be careful of is we put this we put this variable in the right place so that the destructor actually happens at the time we want it to and maybe not too early or something like that or too late or whatever. Well, I guess probably it's not too late, but maybe it could be too early perhaps. And the only other comment I think I need to make with respect to this example, well, actually maybe there's two. Uh, one is we're using this keyword mutable um, it has nothing to do with mutex, even though it shares some letters in common. Um, what mutable does, you can attach mutable to any data member of a, of a class, um, I guess non-static data member of a class. And what it does is it just says, even if the object is const, you're allowed to modify this thing. Um, effectively, what you're saying when something is mutable, you're kind of saying this is not really part of the value of the object. So in other words, even if it's const, I can still change it because it's not really part of, considered to be part of the value of the object. And we have to kind of do this with something like if you're using mutexes, then typically those objects will be mutable. Because uh, if they weren't, then what this would mean is that you can't do any kind of locking, like you can't use mutexes in the case the object is const. Uh, because clearly locking a mutex and unlocking a mutex is mutating the state of the mutex. In other words, it's not a const operation. Um, so if, if this was not mutable, and then you had like const member functions for this class, like for example, this thing here, this function could not lock the mutex because locking the mutex requires mutating the state of the integer set because the, the mutex is part of that class. It's like a data member of that class. Um, so it's a quite common sort of use case to see for mutable where you have mutexes and mutexes are often specified as mutable. Um, but I think, well, at least for what we're doing in this course, there's not any other justifiable use case for mutable. And typically people don't like to introduce this when they're kind of you know early on teaching C++ because people who don't know how to write const correct code, the way they solve the problem is just make every mem data member mutable. Then effectively it doesn't matter whether things are const or not because you're saying ignore const, you can change anything. Um, so you only want to use mutable in cases where it's really justified. And this is, I would say, the, at least in this course, this is the, really the only justifiable use case, but it's an important use case though. Any questions? Uh, maybe one other comment I can make with respect to the interface that's provided by this integer set here. Um, it's not really designed very well from the point of view that um, it, it, the interface is not really behaving in a way that we'd probably like it to use from a user point of view. So for example, the, the contains function is, is doing the locking. Um, in other words, it's not the user that's responsible for making sure that, that there's not any kind of data races or other race conditions. It's falling on the responsibility of the class. But this particular design is not really a very good one in the sense that um, you imagine that you're a user of this class, you call contains and you give it some value because maybe you want to see if zero is in the, con in the container, so you call it with zero. And then it returns back to you and says maybe true, like it's in the container. Uh, but so what? Because the instant you look, between the time you look at that value that, that you got returned back true and the time you do something based on that, another thread could come along and, and take zero out of the container, so now it's false. Um, in other words, 
for any probably practical use case of this predicate here, probably the user is going to have to wrap this in some kind of mutex or do some kind of um, do something to make sure that between the time it tries to make a decision of what to do based on the fact that the container did, did or did not include this value and the time that it actually does the thing, um, you want to make sure that no thread comes along and changes the state of the container so that the assumption that you made about whether this condition was true or not is still valid. Uh, so if, because of the way the interface is presented here, it maybe doesn't make that much sense to do the locking in the way we're doing. I mean, technically it avoids the problem of data races and so on, but it's maybe not an interface that's very useful to the user. Um, but that's not really, the interface design is not really part of the point of this slide. It's just showing you how you can use mutexes to avoid data races and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, question about sort of like these objects that might be used in a multi-thread context. What happens if one thread is calling a method and it's currently executing code inside of the method and then another thread which uh, owns the object, uh, it, it leaves scope and the object being destroyed. What happens to the other thread that's still executing code in the object while it's being destroyed? Well, I mean, if you're just if you're accessing something that's being destroyed, this is going to be bad news. I mean, because then you you don't really know what's going to happen, right? There's probably going to maybe there's probably likely if it's a more complicated data structure, there's probably some pointers that are kind of in, in quest, highly questionable states. They're probably pointing into some memory that's no longer allocated. Maybe another thread's come along, allocated that chunk of memory, started writing variables into it, and then you write variables and you write your values in there. And next thing you know, you're stomping over another thread's data. Um, does that answer? Yeah, so you make sure to protect the object from outside. There's no way in the object that you can actually protect against this sort of behavior. I mean, this this comes back to like. Um, I don't know if it was last lecture or an earlier lecture, but I talked about lifetime bugs. This is a very common type of problem that appears in you know C++ code where you know you get too excited about releasing the memory and destroying the objects. In other words, you do this before everyone's done using it. Um, even if you're writing single-threaded code, this can sometimes be like a tricky issue that can trip people up. But once you start dealing with uh, multi-threaded programs, the problem kind of becomes even that much worse because it, you don't have to just ask the question, like when you're saying, is it safe for me to like destroy and, and deallocate memory? You don't have to just ask the question, am I done using it? Like the thread that's doing this, you also have to ask, is every other thread in the system, like in the program also done using it? And this can be like maybe more, even more error prone, like where you say, oh yeah, things are done, but you miss some edge case and in some situations it's not done. And then you basically destroy something from under the foot of another thread. So um, there's nothing special that kind of prevents you from doing these sorts of bugs, but you you just want to kind of structure your code in a way where it's less likely that they'll happen. But it's it's a it's a difficult problem. But there's not really any great, great answer to it, just to be careful, essentially. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so I just want to comment on uh, like an acquisition of multiple locks. So I kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, if you have a situation where for some particular processing that a thread needs to do, it needs to acquire multiple locks, maybe because there's multiple resources that it needs that are shared that it needs to access all at the same time to do some particular processing. You have to be very careful when you start acquiring multiple locks kind of at the same time. Otherwise, it's very easy to get into situations where you can deadlock. Um, in particular, for example, if you suppose that you need to acquire like n different locks to perform some task, it's really important that you acquire them always in the same order. Don't sometimes acquire them in one order, other times acquire them in a different order. Otherwise, it's very easy to show the system can deadlock. And maybe to illustrate this point, I suppose that you have a situation where there's two mutexes that are being used to protect some, maybe some shared data between threads. Um, and you need to acquire both of these mutexes before you can do whatever operation it is you want to do. And suppose that you don't always acquire these mutexes in a consistent order. So sometimes you acquire the first, mer first mutex and then the second one, other times you acquire the second one and then the first one. So if you do this, then this is just a recipe for deadlock. For example, what can happen is that thread one, it tries to acquire mutex one. Um, and then before it has a chance to acquire the other mutex, thread two comes along, it acquires mutex two. Notice that they're acquiring the mutexes in a different order. Thread one is trying to do mutex one and then mutex two. Thread two is trying to do mutex two and then mutex one. And then this is where things start to go, back, go wrong here is that now thread one says, well, I'm going to try to acquire mutex two. That's fine. Of course, it's going to get blocked because thread two already has this mutex. So it goes to sleep, basically waiting for that thread, thread two, to release the mutex. Then where the, the deadly thing happens is now thread two tries to acquire the mutex one, mutex number one. 
it locks because thread one already has it, but now we've just deadlocked because essentially what we have is thread one is blocked waiting for thread two to release the mutex it has. Thread two is blocked waiting for thread one to release the mutex it has. Since they're both blocked, nothing can ever release either mutex and neither thread is ever going to wake up and they just deadlocked. Um, so this is what I mean by acquisition of multiple locks. Generally speaking, if you can avoid it, it's, it's always better to not have the situation where you need to acquire multiple locks. I mean, sometimes it maybe can't be avoided if the situation is complex enough, but if you can avoid it, better to do so, because then all these problems about like, how do you acquire locks and so on, and worrying, worrying about sort of deadlock avoidance mechanisms, all this stuff is, is not necessary anymore. Any questions? So if I wanted to give an example of a situation where we're acquiring two locks, just to keep things simple, so like more than one, but, but not a lot more than one, we have two locks. The particular example I have here is a big buffer type. So it's called big buff. And what it is, it's a 16 megabyte buffer. Um, the size is basically dictated by the return value of this function here. And essentially as data members, what we have is we have a, a vector of char, which is basically the underlying buffer. So it's gonna be like 16 megabytes in size. And we have a mutex that we can use to protect this, uh, this data, because it's going to be shared potentially between different threads, assuming that multiple threads are going to be using the buffer at this, you know, buffer as they're running. And then inside, the, the, really the main point of this uh, example is the swap function here. So what we want to do is we want to provide the ability that you can kind of swap the guts of two, two buffers. And basically we're going to do this sort of like essentially like a move. We're just going to swap the pointers or basically we do swaps of the vectors, but this is going to swap the underlying pointers associated with those vectors. So what we do inside the swap function, we basically do our usual check to make sure that we're not doing self-assignment or like self-swapping, swapping with ourselves. in which case we don't really need to do anything. If we swap with ourselves. we can just say that we're done. Um, but if we actually need to do something, this is the more interesting part. The, the mistake that's made here is we need to acquire two mutexes because there's two big buffs involved here. There's the the actual this object, like star this, and then there's the big buff that we're swapping with, which is represented by other here. So there's two objects involved. We need to lock both of them. Otherwise, we could end up with data races and things. So we lock M, the mutex for star this, and then we lock the mutex for the other mutex, and then we perform the swap. So we're effectively in a protected region here, so a protected section, so it's okay to do the swap at this point. The problem is, though, even though it looks like you know, we only have one place where we're locking these these objects, like in this code, like because it's a relatively simple class. There's only one place where we're doing locking. So, like, how could anything go wrong here? I mean, there's one place we're always locking in the same order because it's you know it's always the same function that's being called that's doing locking. Uh, but the problem is you could have a situation arise like the use case that's shown down below here, where we have two big buffs A and B, and then we have two threads which are represented by the variables T1 and T2. And all the first thread is doing, the ones associated with T1 here, it's just looping for a very large number of times, swapping A and B. So it, like, it gives the object A and it says swap it with B. And then this other thread, it's basically doing a very similar thing, but instead it's giving B and it's saying swap with A. Uh, but this very subtle change will cause, when this function here is called, it will cause these lockings to occur in the opposite order. And, and as soon as this happens, you have the possibility that you could deadlock. And actually, because of the large number of iterations here, I would say probably it's a very safe bet that this will actually deadlock probably every time that you run it. Um, so the question then becomes, well, how can we avoid this problem? And this was one of the comments that I made earlier with respect to scope lock, is scope lock actually allows you to provide multiple mutexes. So the way that you can avoid this problem is you can just do a, create a single lock object and provide both m and other dot m as per arguments to that constructor. And when, when uh, scope lock locks multiple mutexes, it applies a deadlock avoidance algorithm. So it guarantees that it won't do something silly, like for example, use inconsistent orders to lock things in so that you get a deadlock uh, possibly arising. Um, so this is the way that we could resolve this problem. So on this slide, this is showing how we can fix the, the example from the previous slide, which is just a very kind of very simple fix. All we've done is instead of doing two uh, scope lock objects, we have just a single one and it locks both of the mutexes in a single constructor invocation. And then this is guaranteed not to have the problem that we were just talking about in the previous example. Any questions? So there's another template class called unique lock. And 
essentially, it's another kind of wrapper class, so basically an RAI class. The, the main reason for it to exist is to allow you to, to make it less likely that you forget to unlock a mutex. So the basic idea is in the destructor, it's going to say, like, if I'm holding the mutex, I'm going to release it. Uh, but the difference between a unique lock and then scope lock that we talked about earlier, one of the main differences anyway, is that in the case of a scope lock, you always have to hold the, the mutex. So like when you construct a scope lock object, it will lock the mutexes that you provide as arguments to the constructor. Um, there is an option where you can say don't lock them. However, the, the implication is it's assumed that you're not locking them because you already hold the mutexes. So in other words, whenever you're using scope lock, you're presumed to be holding the mutexes. Uh, whereas in the case of unique lock, you have the ability to not always be holding them. So when you construct a unique lock object, you can kind of optionally lock the mutexes when you, when you construct the object, or you can defer till later if you want. But also while you are doing other stuff, like while you're in the lifetime of that uh, unique lock object, you can also lock and unlock as many times as you want. Um, and then what the destructor for unique lock does is it checks to see is the particular uh, mutex that, that this unique lock is uh, kind of uh, working with, it checks to see if it's held at the time that the destructor for unique lock is invoked. And if it is, then it will release the mutex, otherwise it just does nothing. Uh, so this is kind of the basic idea behind unique lock. Again, it's another kind of RAI wrapper class that allows you to try to reduce the chance that you forget to unlock a mutex, but it's a little bit more uh, feature rich in the sense that you kind of have more options that you may choose to defer the locking from the construction time. In other words, you can exit the constructor without locking anything. You can say, I want to defer to later, and then you have to call lock, uh, like a lock member function for unique lock to do this. And you can also um, release the mutexes as well, which you can't do with the scope lock. It had no way to say unlock, the, like release that lock. Um, also, another difference between uh, scope lock and unique lock is that unique lock is movable. In the case of scope lock, it's not movable and it's not copyable. So there's really nothing you can much you can do with scope lock. Uh, but at least this one's movable. It's not copyable, so you can at least move it around, which might be a helpful thing if you want to. Uh, maybe you want to return a unique lock from a function or something. At least as long as you're you're invoking a move by doing the return, then at least this is possible. So I have a list of uh, different members for this uh, unique lock class. The uh, first is a list of member types. So again, it has a mutex type. Because it's a template, you might want to ask the question like after the template's been instantiated at some later point, like what was the mutex type that this thing was instantiated for? So this gives you access to that type. Uh, has Obviously has a constructor and destructor I kind of talked about. It has a move assignment operator and also a move constructor. You can move from it, but you can't copy it. Um, it also has some uh, functions which relate to locking. So you can, it's a lock member function which will basically acquire the mutex and, and block if it's, if it's not available, a block until it is available and then lock it in return. Uh, and then we have try lock, well, three variants of like trying. Uh, basically all of these are sort of non-block, well, either non-blocking or kind of blocking only for a limited amount of time. Try lock is like completely non-blocking. It tries to acquire the mutex if it's not available because someone already holds the mutex, then it just returns saying I wasn't able to acquire it. In the case of try lock for and try lock until, these are, are blocking, but they only block for a limited period of time. You can specify a timeout. Like try for this period of time, you can block me, but after that timeout expires, please let me continue on. Return and just say that you weren't able to acquire the mutex. And Basically, the only difference between try lock for and try lock until one specifies a duration, one specifies an endpoint in time. So there's not really any huge difference between them. And then unlock allows us to release the mutex that's associated with the unique lock. Um, then we have some functions which are basically allow us to observe some state about the unique lock. We can check to see whether the unique lock is currently holding the mutex that's associated with it. So this returns a owns lock returns a bool like a boolean value to say is the lock currently being held? And also it has a conversion operator to convert to bool, uh, which basically gives you the same thing. It, it basically tells you like true or false, do you hold the lock or not? And then to give an example of how we might use unique lock in the code or sort of the pattern that's followed by it. Um, well, maybe I should make a few comments first about before I talk about the example specifically. Like generally speaking, you don't want to hold locks, like hold mutexes any longer than you need to, because anytime you're holding that lock, holding that mutex, you're preventing other threads potentially from being able to do useful work. Their block may be waiting to try to acquire the mutex. So as a general rule, you don't want to hold a mutex if you don't need it. 
So what this example is trying to illustrate is suppose that you have some kind of code where you're, maybe you're doing a loop like what we have here. So func here is basically executing in, as, the, as the code for two different threads. And we have this shared variable counter that's being essentially incremented at various points within this, this loop. Um, but suppose that you know, there's other stuff that's being done in this loop represented by these dot, dot, dots that might take a fair amount of time to do. Um, in that case, we wouldn't want to just acquire the lock at the top of the loop and hold it the entire duration of this loop because maybe one iteration takes a very, very long period of time because maybe these dot, dot, dot operations are doing like very computationally expensive stuff. Um, so if we just lock things for the whole duration of the iteration and then finally release it just at the bottom, this would be blocking a lot of threads possibly from making progress. Like they're gonna be blocked waiting on the thread. So it's much preferable only to lock the mutex at times where we really need it. So in this particular case, the, the basic idea for using the mutex is we have the shared variable counter that's being shared between two threads and we wanna protect against data races, for example. So we wanna make sure that only one thread can access counter at a time. So we wrap it with a lock unlock pair. And with unique lock, we have the ability. So in this case, when I create this unique lock, what I'm specifying is this is the mutex associated with the lock. And this option here is saying, I want to defer the locking of this mutex. In other words, in the constructor, don't do any locking. I'm gonna do it later if I need it. So this is one difference with unique lock is you have the ability to say, I don't want to lock things, I'll lock them later. And then what's happening is down below here, we're maybe doing some computationally expensive stuff where we don't need the lock, so let's not lock the mutex. Then finally, we reach a point where we're about to increment the counter. So now we need to lock the mutex. So we call lock on this unique lock object. But if any exception got thrown, for example, we leave this function, this, because we're using a unique lock here, it would know that in the destructor, if we kind of maybe, well, there's not gonna be an exception thrown here, but imagine that there could be an exception thrown by incrementing this counter. Um, we're sort of protected here because if we kind of got violently ripped out of this block here, while this uh, unique lock is locked, what would happen is in the destructor, it would check to see, is this locked? And the answer would be yes. And then what it's going to do is it will release the mutex. So one of the benefits, again, like of using things like unique lock, scope lock, is you get this protection against like forgetting to, either forgetting to release the mutex or not releasing the mutex due to an exception being thrown. Um, anyway, uh, in addition, like what this example is trying to illustrate, if you have like a lot of computation where you want to lock and unlock at various different places and try to minimize the amount of time where you're locking, this is useful for that purpose. Scope lock doesn't give you the ability to unlock. You basically destroy the object and then that can unlock things. Uh, but here we can unlock and lock as many times as we like. So this is the basic behavior that's provided by the unique lock class. And I better stop here because I'm running out of time.